All right, so you heard Davey's story. Now, now you get to hear mine. So uh, a little different than the other guys at Fretless because um, they all have done programming for a long, long time. Um, so they definitely had the te technical capability in this area. And then gradually, just over time, becoming leaders on their teams and things like that, developed the other two uh, and getting involved in meetups in the community, um, developing the other two areas uh, to become senior developers. Mine was sort of the opposite um, because I really didn't have a lot of programming experience. It's not something I really did until really the last uh, year and a half or so. Um, but what I did have coming into it, and I found out after I was already hired by Fretless, they hired me because of the connectedness and leadership and figured they could teach me the other thing pretty quick. Um, so, yeah, how did I do that? Because that is not a natural strength for me. My guess is, as you look at these three areas, you probably know for yourself um, that you are stronger in one of these areas more than the others. And uh, for most of my life, it was definitely not those two. It was not connectedness and leadership. Uh, it took a very specific path to get better at those. Um, what I relied on for the majority of my life actually was technical capability. So come with me on a magical journey <laughs> to use Davies parlance. Uh, back to when I was 12 years old, when I first started using technical capability quite a bit for the first time. So I was a bit of an odd child. Um, at 12 years old, I went to my parents and I said, mom and dad, I want to be able to buy things. I need to get a job. And they said, well, you can't because there's child labor laws. <laughs> and I was like, that's stupid. I'm going to do my own thing then. So like Davey, I started uh, mowing lawns, um, pushing a lawnmower around the neighborhood and uh, asking people if I could mow their lawns. Took it to a little bit more of an extreme than Davey did. Uh, by the time I graduated high school, I was mowing 60 lawns a week. Um, yeah. And you might be thinking, like, what does mowing have to do with technical capability? Uh, and I would say, if you're asking that question, then you don't know enough about mowing. <laughs> so, uh, like, I would seriously bring, like, mower brochures to class while I was in, in school and just, like, read them and, like, memorize the specifications for mowers. Uh, I would also, like, draw out customers' lawns on paper and then, like, plan, like, okay, if I park the truck here, then I can unload the mower. I start going this way. This pattern is optimal for efficiency like all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, also, there's a whole area of like uh, mower regulations. For instance, as you know, that the maximum blade tip speed that's allowed by law for a mower is 19,000 feet per minute. <laughs> you know, important stuff you need to know. Oh, also another good one. Uh, something you might not have th thought about, you know, when you're using a weed eater, right? Everybody knows, obviously, which way the head rotates. It's clockwise. So the problem is for right-handed people, if you hold it this way, which is the normal way, and so to walk forward, you're actually doing suboptimal work because you're going the same direction as the string. So you don't get the best cut. So you either have to walk backwards or train yourself to trim left-handed. So obviously I chose to train myself to trim left-handed. So yeah, there's a lot of work and technical capability that goes into properly mowing lawns. So that was my first uh, foray into that. <laughs> and no, no joke, the guy is a professional bodybuilder. Yeah, that is true. I'm actually surprised. So uh, last year it came up quite a bit, but I don't think anybody has found uh, my pictures online of bodybuilding competitions. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> yep, definitely. Put on the fake tanner and everything. Get up here. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so that was high school. And then uh, continuing to rely on technical capability. Um, I went to college. I actually didn't want to go to college because um, at that point, I think I was making more than my dad. And... Uh, I was like, I don't want to go to school, Dad. And he's like, but you have to. I'm like, but I make more than you. He's like, I don't care. You have to. And so I was like, fine, I'll do it. But I'm going to pick the shortest amount of time that I can be there 
So I had taken a couple of AP classes uh, and I figured out just based on the credits that I would have transferring in that I could actually do chemistry in the shortest amount of time. So that was the sole reason why I chose what I majored in. Uh, so I, right, yeah. So I did that, took a couple uh, 20 some credit hour semesters uh, and graduated that in, in three years. And then uh, I decided that I should just move to Florida for no apparent reason. <laughs> um, so I did that, uh, started working for, I did a variety of jobs for those of you that read the, the blog post uh, on fretless.com. There were a variety of jobs in there, but the main ones were like um, as a pharmaceutical chemist and then as like an R&D chemist for a place that made blood glucose meters. Um, so like diabetic testing supplies. But I found out pretty quick that you can't really do anything interesting with just like a, a bachelor's degree in chemistry. Like FDA regulations require that they have somebody with a bachelor's in chemistry to do things, but honestly it's a lot of those jobs are something that pretty much any, anybody could do. Um, so all the interesting jobs were for master's levels and PhD. So I was like, that's cool. I think I'll do that now. Leaving out some of the best parts. Well, like what? What did you move to Florida to do? Oh, yeah. So it was not no apparent reason. Well, okay. There was an apparent reason. Uh, I decided when I graduated that I wanted to be a professional wakeboarder. And uh, so I bought a boat after I sold, I sold all the mowers and bought a boat. And then it got cold, obviously, in Indiana. And I was like, well, I guess I have to move to Florida. <laughs> <laughs> but then the gas prices went up and I ran out of money. So I decided, <laughs> let's do something different. Uh, so anyway, at this point, I decided that being a bachelor's level chemist is not interesting. I need to go back to school. So I applied to uh, Notre Dame for grad school. Got accepted. I had no idea that school was in Indiana, even though I grew up here. It always seemed more like an East Coast school to me. I got my acceptance letter and then like a, a plane ticket to go visit the school. I'm like, why am I flying to South Bend? That's really weird. <laughs> so then I looked it up and realized that's where it actually is. Uh, so I did that, went to grad school. Um, that was also my first uh, exposure to teaching. Taught some undergrad classes there in addition to the, the graduate level work. Uh, about two and a half years into that, I realized probably not my life calling to do chemistry. Um, like I enjoyed it, but there were some people in class that like really loved chemistry. And I was like, I don't feel that way about this at all. <laughs> so I quit school and uh, became a mechanical engineer. Because why not? It's all just math, right? So um, I got a job as a R&D engineer making biomass furnaces. So that was a fun job because A, I got to learn how to weld to make prototypes and B, we got to burn stuff all the time. So that was fun. <laughs> um, but about this time, so that was around, uh, I've been there for about a year when like that 2008 financial crisis thing whole happened. Um, and what I was working on was pretty, uh, experimental for the company at the time. Um, and so they weren't sure if they were going to continue it after like all that recession stuff happened. <laughs> and I was like, that's fine. Uh, I just got this iPhone like a week ago. I think I'll go work for Apple instead. <laughs> so I went to uh, the Apple store at the Keystone Mall and told them that I wanted to work there. And uh, they were like, well, what would you want to do? I'm like, well, I'm pretty technically savvy. So I'd like to work on your technical support team. They're like, uh, we don't actually need that, but you could sell stuff. And I was like, all right, fine, but I'll be in charge of your technical support team within two years. And they're like, whatever, here's a shirt, go sell stuff. Uh, so it took a year and a half. Um, <laughs> but again, just relying on the technical capability that I'd uh, gotten pretty well honed at this point. Uh, you know, just like every night when I would go home from work, I would just study uh, all the specifications on products and uh, like Unix systems and all that sort of stuff. So then when uh, a spot did open up on the technical support team, uh, I was able to transfer in pretty easily. Kept studying, um, again, using my techniques of figuring out the most efficient ways to do things. Did you know I can replace a logic board in a MacBook Pro in eight minutes and 43 seconds? Um, yeah, totally, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I like 
Oh, yeah, I can do that. But anyway. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so then I got put in charge of the team uh, when the current leader of that left, and uh, I thought it was going pretty well. Uh, so about two months into it, our stats for the team as a whole had started to improve a little bit, and I was like feeling pretty good about myself. And then I get called into the office when we have the uh, visit from our district manager, who is now in ch actually in charge of the entire eastern half of the United States now. She's been promoted a couple of times. And uh, she brought me in there and she's like, you know what? I think we made a mistake in hiring you for this position. Uh, I don't think you were ready for it and it, it's really not working out. Like you need to make some changes. So this might be the first time in my life where I've been told that I'd done a bad job on something and it did not go well. Uh, I didn't take that very well. But this is also my first piece of advice. If someone who's really good at something tells you that you are bad at it, even in a nice way, you should probably listen to them. Because uh, my first inclination was, she probably doesn't know what she's talking about. This is, uh, you know, everything has gone well up to this point. You know, I can look at these numbers on the sheet and everything looks fine. Um, and I was like, well, I'll probably just leave and go do something else now. Yeah. Definitely. Um, so yeah, I did have a, a little problem with arrogance at this point, for sure. Um, but yeah, luckily at that point, I had done enough uh, like customer interactions to like s at least start to develop a sense of empathy, which was definitely not a strong point for me initially. Uh, and so like just enough to where I'm like considering the possibility that you know maybe they are right, maybe I don't actually know everything, and uh, there's things about this that I don't know. So uh, after admitting to myself that maybe I do actually suck at something and uh, so bad, suck at something so bad that I don't even know that I suck at it. Is anybody familiar with the Dunning-Kruger effect? It's like the idea that uh, people who don't know a lot about something way overestimate their competency at it. Yeah, so I was a prime example of that because while I could fix a computer very well, uh, I knew nothing about managing people whatsoever. So, um, after realizing that not only did I not know how to do it well, but I didn't even know where to start because I was so bad at it, um, next step was to get some help, so find some mentors. Luckily, we had a really good leadership team at the store, um, so going to my boss and asking for some help um, and really just being like, where do I even start? Uh, another good thing is uh, finding some people to observe. So once I kind of knew that a, I'm bad at leading people or influencing people. Um, who are some people that I feel like do that really well? And we had some examples that worked there. So I would watch them and see how they do things, ask them, you know, what, uh, what goes through your mind? What's your mindset when you are speaking to a crowd? Or what's you, what do you try to do when you're having a one-on-one, -on -one, like emotionally, like what are you trying to, how are you trying to connect with this person? Um, also, I think a really important part of it too was um, specifically putting yourself in situations where you have to practice. So you can kind of think of it almost like writing. So everybody has like a dominant hand for writing. And so if you write with that hand, it's fine. You've been practicing that for years. If you try to write with your non-dominant hand, it looks terrible. And uh, you also probably have a tendency to want to give up and go back to the thing that's easy real quick. So one of the things that's really effective for developing skills that you're not naturally strong at is to make it so you can't use the skills that you are strong in as a crutch. So like for instance, I was always really strong in the technical aspect of it and my tendency for my leadership style initially was to, uh, if somebody wasn't doing a particularly good job or needed some help, I would just kind of go in and take over for them um, because that's what I found it easiest to do. And uh, I can't say I came up with this suggestion myself. It was, again, from one of the mentors that I found through this process. They were like, all right, so your goal for today is to not literally go through the entire day not touching anything. Like, I want you to put your hands behind your back and, like, don't touch anything the whole time. So that way you have to use your words to talk to people and uh, explain what you need and be able to connect with them that way. And that was probably one of the most valuable uh, lessons that I learned is uh, if you find yourself in a position where you're doing particularly well in one or maybe two areas and you're uh, weak in another, is find a way to put yourself consistently in situations where you not only have to use that thing, but like you can't use the areas that you're strong in. Um, so yeah, eventually, it still took a long time. I started to get slightly better. After about two years of that, 
uh, they were like, okay, maybe you're not terrible at your job anymore. I'm like, that's an improvement. That's good. And then after about uh, probably three and a half to four years, then they're like, you're, you're actually doing pretty good. And then closer to five years, they're like, we're actually going to bring some people in here to learn from you, like people that are new to this position and other stores. And so that felt really good. Um, but yeah, it, it can take a very long time, a very specific practice. And this whole time, you know, I'm focusing entirely on this and not using technical capability. And honestly, at that point, I started to miss it a little bit. Uh, so at the point where I finally got to the, the level where I felt like it was, I, I at least was competent in the other two areas, um, I was like, I'd really like to start using technical capability again. So that's the point where uh, I started pursuing programming and uh, met Davey at a one-week boot camp where, uh, and then we stayed in touch after that. So then when it came time to like make the full jump over to um, going to the 12-week boot camp, I did that and uh, that's how I got to where I am, basically. Similar experience in some regards. Um, in, in some regards, I, I'm not a whole lot like 